Hello, welcome to CSC 7013, Advanced Math for Computer Scientists. This is Brady Chen. Today we're going to talk about Module 9, Introduction to Number Theory. Number Theory has many applications. The well-known RSA crypto system is built upon number theory. So that's something we're going to talk about uh, in this module. Now we're going to divide module 9 into three parts, A, B, and C. In module 9A, we're going to talk about the concept of divisibility and uh, the division algorithm. Also, we're going to talk about the Euclidean algorithm, which is used to find the greatest common divisor. Now, in number theory, we are mostly dealing with the integers, the whole number. And some of the topics are so simple that they are even covered in the elementary school. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the divisibility. Let's first define what what does it mean that the B divides A. Okay. So we say that a number which is non-zero number B divides A if we can write A as the multiplication of B and another integer M. Okay. So in here, all the numbers are involved are integers, a, b, and m. So b divides a if a equals m times b. So also, if we say b divides b, that means you can actually divide, you can divide a by b and there should be no remainder on the division. For example, so let's talk about uh, two numbers. Okay, let's say B is 3 and A is 18. Right? So then from the definition, we know that the B divides A. Why? Because we can write A, which is 18, equals 3 times or 6 times 3, right? And 3 is a B and 18 is A. So we can write A as the multiplication of 6 and 3. So that means B divides A. Or in another words, uh, we can verify this by doing the division. We, a, we do the 18 divided by 3 right a divided by b um, then we can say okay we can put a quotient uh, 6 and we got the result 18 and 18 minus 18 which is 0 so 0 is the remainder okay now in this case remainder is 0 so that means 3 divides 18 now, in math, we use the notation B and a vertical line means B divides A. Okay. Now, in case that uh, we can write B divides A, we basically say B is the divisor of A. So in this case, uh, in case B of B is 3, A is 18. So B 3 divides 18. So then 3 is a divisor. Okay. Now we can easily find many examples, right? So, so for example, the positive divisors of 24 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24 itself. Why? Because one can divide, one divides 24. 
2 divides 24, 3 divides 24. So all these numbers divides 24. So these are all the divisors of 24. Okay, so here are some more examples. 13 divides 182, minus 5 divides 30, 17 divides 289. So let's check this one. It's not trivial, right? So let's say uh, 289, 17. So we can do the division. Uh, we can put the 1 here. 1 times 17. And then 29, uh, 28 minus 17. So it's 1, 1, 9. Uh, let's say, yeah, we can put the 7. 7 times 17. So uh, that's 1, 1, 9. Okay, that's 0. So we can do the division. 289 divided by 17. And we know the quotient is 17. And uh, the remainder is 0. So 17 divides 289. That's pretty trivial. And 17 divides 0. Now, 0 is a very special number. So why 17 divides 0? We can actually check from the definition, right? If we say B divides A, then we can write A equals the uh, m times equals m times b, right? So if we want to say 17 divides 0, now if we can write 0 as 17 times some number, then we say 17 divides 0, right? Now this is pretty simple. 0 can be write as 0 times 17. So 17 divides 0. Right? For sun zero, or sun, sun number. Um, so zero is a very special. Actually, so any number divides zero, right? So because any number can be right as, uh, zero can be right as zero times any number. So not just a 17. So 16 divides zero, three divides zero. So, you know, any number divides zero. So that's the divisibility. Pretty simple, very basic concept. So let's talk a little bit more about the divisibility. Now, some of the properties listed here are very trivial. Okay. Um, let's take a look at each of these. Now, one, if A divides one, then you can say a could be either either one or minus one. Now, this is this looks very trivial, right? If 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 any number, because num one is the smallest positive integer um, above zero, so zero is different. Now, if anything can divide one then that number is no longer an integer, right? So, so that means the only thing can divide one is the one itself, and all minus one, okay? Now, the second property, if A divides B and B divides A, then a and B are the same, or they, are, they have the same value, but with a negative sign. Now, how can we actually show this is the case? Now, we can easily prove this by definition. Okay, let's take a, take a look. So, what does it mean A divide, divides B? Okay, so that means I can write a B as the multiplication of a number m times a, right? If you forgot, then ch check the previous slides. Uh, so that's a definition 
for a divides b. Now, what does the, what does it mean that the b divides a? So that means I can write a as a multiplication of b and a number. In this case, I use n. Okay. So these are based on the definition. So now, if that's the case, then we can continue. We can combine these two equality. B equals m times a. And now we know a equals n times b, right? So I can replace a with n times b. So then we got m times n equals b. Now b equals m times n times b. Now, if b is non-zero, of course b has to be non-zero because otherwise b cannot be a divisor, right? And a cannot be a zero as well because otherwise, uh, if we try to divide something by zero, that make that doesn't make any sense. So then, we can cancel the b on both sides, right? b equals uh, m times n times b. So we can cancel the b on both sides, replace it with one. So we got one equals m times n. So, so that means either n divides one or n, it's actually n, m divides one. So that means n is positive or minus one by the first you know, property. And also m could be positive or minus one. Okay. So what does that mean? So, so that means b equals, we replace m with positive or minus one. So b equals plus or minus a. Or vice versa. A equals plus or minus B. So either way, doesn't make any difference. So we got this. So if A divides B, B divides A, then A and B are basically the same number. Or maybe the opposite number with the same absolute value. <coughs> That's trivial. A and B which is not zero divides one or divides zero. Okay. So that means it divides zero for any non-zero non number. Why? Because zero can be right as a B times zero, right? So B divides zero. Now, the fourth property, if A divides B, B divides C, then A divides C. Now to prove this again, we're going to use the definition of, the, you know, of this division. So let's prove this. A divides B implies that I can write B as A multiplied by some number. And B divides C, that means I can write C as B times N for sun N. That's by the definition of the division. And then we can combine these two items. So C equals N times B. And then I replace B using this statement, right? So I can say n times m times a. Okay, now I can write c as a multiplication of a times a number. This number is n times m. Okay, m. what does that mean? By definition, that means a divides c, right? Because c can write as a times the number. So a divides c. Okay. Now here's the example. 
11 divides 66, 66 divides 198, then it's trivial, right? We can easily verify this. Now here is another property of divisibility, and it's proof, okay? So if B divides G, so B is a divisor of, right, of G, and also B divides H. If B divides G, B divides H. And then we know B divides M, so number M times G plus another number N times H. Now for arbitrary integers M and N. So this is always true. Okay. Now how can we prove this? Again, we use the definition of the divisibility. Now, if B divides G, then G can be written as B times some integer G1, right? And I use integer G1. Now, B divides H, then H, is, H can be written as B divides some integer H1. Okay. Now, how can, how can I prove that the B divides MG plus NH? Again, based on definition, if we can write MG plus NH as the multiplication of B and another number, right? So let's do this. So MG plus NH, MG plus NH. Now, if we can write this as a multiplication of B times some number, then we can say B divides MG plus NH. So then we replace G with this, right? Because G equals B times G1. Uh, so we replace G with uh, B times G1 and replace H with B times H1. Okay. So now what? So we find out in these two terms, they have a common factor B, right? So we can take a B out using some of the basic uh, number theory. What is this called? A distributive, distributive law, right? So I can take B out, and then the first item becomes M times G1. The second item becomes N times H1. So B, now I can write MG plus NH as a multiplication of B and another number. So we can claim B divides MG plus NH. Okay, now here's an example. Now B is 7, so that's a, the one. And G is 14, 7 divides 14, right? And the H is 63, so 7 divides 63 as well, right? 63, 7, 9. Okay, so, so that means 7 divides 14, 7 divides 63. Now, we just want to make sure, you know, seven. Okay, I forgot, I missed this this extra vertical line. So that means we need to show seven divides three times fourteen. Any three plus two times sixty-three, because seven divides fourteen, seven divides sixty-three. So uh, then we just you know fourteen multiply any number in this case three and the sixteen. 63 divided uh, times any number, in this case it's 2, then 7 divides this one. Okay. So it's pretty simple. We can 
write this one as seven times something. We can actually like take take the seven out as a as a factor. So so seven divides this number, right? Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more about division. So let's given any positive integer n. n is a positive integer, and any non-negative integer a. So a could be positive or zero. Now if we divide a by n, if we divide a by n, now keep that in mind. n may not be able to divide a, so that means a may not be able to write as n times any number. Okay. We may not be able to do this. So that means a is probably not a multiple of n. Okay. So so in that case if we divide a by n we may got a quotient and then we may get the remainder, okay, which is now zero. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit more and by an example. Let's say uh, n equals, so in this case, n equals um, 15, a equals 70. Okay, so that's the example. So, we actually start from zero, and uh, that number is 70, right? That's 70. So, if we divide 70 by 15, divide A by A, which is 17 by N, 15, then we can actually visually using this diagram say, okay, Divide, let's divide 70 by 15. So let's cut the 70 into a smaller piece of 15 each. So that's 15. Okay. That's another 15. So we, when we start from 0, then we end up at the 15, right? That's one section. And then let's cut another piece of 15. So if we start from 15, then we end with 30. Right, and let's cut another piece of 15. So from 30, we ended at 45. Let's cut another length of 15. So from 40 to 60. Okay, now so we're now at the 60, right? Now, if we try to cut another piece of 15, then we find out. That's not a possible because there's only, you know, from 60 to 70, there's only 10 remains. So there's no way we can actually cut a small portion of 15 from, from 10, right? So that 10 is called a remainder, right? And so let's see. So we can write 70 as the sum of all these 15 fragments, right? A fragment of 15. So how many of them? 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have a 4 fragment of 15. Each. So, so that's total of 60, right? Which is 60. Okay. And then we have 10 remains. So we have a total of 70, and we cut a smaller fragment of 15, and we have total 4 fragments plus. A remainder which is smaller than 15. If it's a greater than 15, we can cut another piece, right? But it's smaller, smaller than 15. That it's 10. So we can write the the whole length a as 
4 times 15. So there's a 4 um, fragments of 15 each. So 4 is the quotient. And 10 is the remainder. OK. So we can write 70 as the 4 times 15 plus 10. Now this is generally true. So now we're talking about a piece which is A. So the size is A. Now we want to divide A by N. Okay, so so then we cut into a fragment of length N. Cut another fragment of length N cut another fragment of length n, right? So then we continue to cut until we got, you know, one, two, three, and the last piece, last piece is q. Okay, one, two, three, all the way to q. And then, now qn is smaller than a, but the distance between qn and a should be smaller than n. Otherwise, we can cut another fragment of n, right? Now, this is the remainder. Okay. This is the remainder. So then we can write a as the sum of q times n. n is the divisor. q, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, q, that's the number of the fragments of length n. So that's the quotient. Okay. Plus the remainder, which is r. That's the remainder. So we know that the r is less than n and greater than or equal to zero. If r equals zero, that means n divides a, right? If r is zero, n divides a by definition of divisibility. Now, if r is not zero, then a can write as q times n plus r. That's a division algorithm. And now many times we call Q the quotient, which is actually the value of A divided by N. Now we use this square bracket to represent, sometimes we call the floor division. That means A divided by N, which is a whole number plus a fragment. And if we throw away the fragment, we keep the whole number, that's the quotient, Q. Now, I think we have enough knowledge to build our next algorithm. It's called a Euclidean algorithm. Okay, if you look at the picture here, that's the ancient Greek mathematician, Euclid. Okay, he actually basically uh, invented this algorithm. Okay, it's a one of the basic techniques of number theory. Now, the Euclidean algorithm is used to determine the greatest common divisor of two positive integers. Okay, now, so suppose we have two numbers Okay, like a two positive numbers, uh, 132, uh, 50, 58, okay. Now, we can actually find the divisors of, for each of the number. So that, find uh, the list of numbers that they can divide 132. Now, this requires a lot of work. And then we can also find a divisor of 58. And now we know some of the divisors are common divisor. For example, uh, two, two can divide, two divides 132, right? Because 132 is an even number, so it can be divided by two. And the 58 can divide, can be divided by two. So two divides 58. So in this case, two can divide both, both the number. So two is a common divisor, okay? 
And now we may be able to find more common divisors. Okay. Now, in order to find the greatest common divisor, that means it's a common divisor. It, it divides both numbers, but it's the greatest one, the largest one. Now, typically, you, you need to find all the divisors for 132, and we find all the divisors for 58. And then we just compare these, the list of divisors for both numbers, and we find the largest one. This requires a lot of work. Now, Euclidean algorithm allows us to quickly deter, determine the greatest common divisor of two positive integers. Okay. Now, based on this, you can easily find whether two numbers are something called a relative prime. That's the, the other concept that we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, for now, let's actually skip that third actually statement. Okay. So, the greatest common divisor of two integer a and b is the largest integer that divides both a and b. Now we can actually take a look at a very simple example. Uh, let's say 15 and 12. So we know that uh, um, one can divide 15, uh, three can divide 15, five can divide 15. Uh, what else? 15 itself can divide 15, right? Um, 12, one can divide 12, um, two can divide 12, right? Three can divide 12, and four can divide 12, six can divide 12, and 12 can divide 12. So now we know that uh, one can divide every number, right? So one is always the common divisor. <laughs> That's trivial. So we normally ignore the, the number one. And also, every number can divide itself, right? Every number can divide itself. Now, in this case, we try to find the first one, the common divisor. The second is the largest common divisor, the greatest common divisor. Okay, now what what's the common divisor? One is common divisor. No no question about this. Uh, three is a common divisor, right? Five is the divisor of fifteen, but not twelve. And uh, four, six, twelve. These are all the divisor of twelve, but not fifteen. So looks like a three is the the largest common divisor. Okay. So that's basically, uh, you know, the way we can use to determine the largest common divisor. But that's not the easy way, uh, because if the numbers are, are big, then it's not easy to list all the divisors. So, um, so if for the greatest common divisor, we can use the notation GCD, greatest common divisor of a and b okay now the gcd zero zero that's a very tricky one and uh, honestly the gcd of zero and zero can be any number if we don't actually define this so that's why in math we we have to actually set this assume that the GCD of 0, 0 is 0, because 1 is also a common divisor of 0, 0, because any number is a divisor of 0. So that means, you know, GCD of 0, 0 could be 1, could be 2, could be any number. So the greatest common divisor of 0 and 0 doesn't exist, right? Because 100 is the common divisor of 0, 0. 200 is common divisor of 0, 0. So which one is the largest one? There's no limit. So in math, in this case, to make our math theory simple, we simply de define the greatest common divisor of 0, 0 is 0. It's not because that's the only one, because, you know, 
if we don't define this, it's not determined. You know, any number could be the GCD of zero zero. So we assume that the zero is the one. Okay. So to define the greatest common divisor, we can also use another. You know, you can say this is a definition, but you know it's um, it's also the uh, property of the greatest common divisor. Okay, now a positive integer c is said to be the GCD of a and b if c is a divisor of a and b. Okay, so c is a divisor of a and b, but you may actually have many, many divisors, right? So then the second item says, any divisor of A and B is a divisor of C. Okay. So now if these two conditions are true, then we are pretty sure that the C is the greatest common divisor. So let me say it again. So for a positive integer C, is said to be the greatest common divisor of A and B if number one C is the divisor of A and B. Number two, any divisor of A and B is a divisor of C. Then C is the greatest common divisor. When we think about this, it looks like this is this should be the truth, right? And it is true. We can actually prove it. But uh, at this moment, we just list this as another definition for the greatest common divisor. Okay, so so we can use the equivalent def definition for the greatest common divisor. Okay, so the greatest common divisor of A and B is defined as the maximum maximum number of among all the k such that k divides A and k divides B. Okay, so k divides a and k divides b means k is a divisor of a and b. And now we just say, okay, among all the numbers k that divides a both divides both a and b, we choose the maximum number, and that's the greatest common divisor, right? So for example. Uh, in this example, we know that the, the list of k could be 1. 1 is a common divisor, right? 1 divides a, 15. 1 divides 12. And also, k could be 3, because 3 divides 15, 3 divides 12. And then we choose the maximum between these two numbers. So the maximum is 3, right? So that's another definition. Now, because we require that the, the greatest common divisor uh, be a positive number, okay, so then if we talk about the greatest common divisor of A and B, and then if A is like, a, a, let's say, a, a, A is 8, B is 12. Now, then we know the GCD of A and B is what's the greatest common divisor of A and B? It's actually 4. We know 4 divides 8, 4 divides 12. But you cannot find any bigger number that that divides both A and B. Now, what about this? A is negative 8, B is 12. So then we say that, uh, of course, um, you know, negative 4 divides negative 8, negative 4 divides negative 12. But by the definition, the greatest common divisor has to be a positive number. So it's also 4, right? So the greatest common divisor of negative 8 and 12 is also 4. 
even though negative 4 divides both numbers. But by the definition, to, to make sure it's that, that the greatest common divisor is unique, we always assume it's a positive number. So the greatest common divisor of negative 8 and 12 is also 4. So, so in general, we can say, you know, greatest common divisor of a and b, the greatest common divisor of a and minus b, and the greatest common divisor of minus a and b, and the greatest common divisor of minus a and minus b are the same. Okay, they're the same. So in that case, so any, any time when we try to figure out what's the greatest common divisor of two numbers, whether they're positive number or negative number, we can also, we can always ignore the, the negative sign and keep the positive one. So that's why, in general, regardless the sign of A and B, A could be positive, B could be positive, or A could be negative, and B could be positive. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether A and B are negative or positive. We can always think about the greatest common divisor of absolute value of A and an absolute value of B. We can always think about a positive number. So, so if someone say, what's the greatest common divisor of minus 181 and minus 131? Then we can always convert the problem to finding the to find the greatest common divisor 181 and 131. We can actually find this one. And once we find the greatest common divisor of this this problem, and then we say that's the same number for this, the same result for the top problem. So so every time we can ignore the negative sign. Okay. Also, because all non-zero integer divide zero, we always have the greatest common divisor of a and the zero is the absolute value of a. Okay. If a is a positive number, it's a. If it's a negative number, then it's it's the absolute value of that number. Okay. Now we state we stated that the two integers, remember the previous slides, we, I just actually skipped the last uh, statement. Uh, we, talk, we talked about the, uh, the relative prime. Okay, so we stated that the two integers a and b are relatively prime if their only common positive integer factor is 1. Or in another word, so we actually say that the a and b are relative prime if the greatest common divisor of a and b is 1. So if we have two numbers and the greatest common divisor is 1, that means the only common divisor for these two numbers is 1. That means these two numbers are called relatively prime. Now, you should keep in mind that the concept of relatively prime is not the same as prime. Okay. Now, what is a prime? We're going to define this later. A prime number is means that the, that number can be divided by either one and itself and nothing else. So prime number is the number which is not divisible. So no one, no other number can divide that number. Okay, that's the prime number. Now relative prime means these two number has no common factors except for one. As we mentioned, that the one can divide any number. So one is actually out of the question. So we normally treat one as a very special number. But if two number, the only common divisor is one, then we are called these two number a relative prime. Okay. Okay. Now let's, you know, state what is the Euclidean algorithm. The Euclidean algorithm that is used 
that is used to computer to calculate the greatest common divisor of two numbers. Okay. Now the Euclidean algorithm is based on the following theorem. You probably actually are confused with the notation. So then I let, let me explain this. In order to find the greatest common divisor of A and B, now we assume that the a and, both A and B are positive, right? If it's negative, we just switch the, the sign to positive. And this won't actually change the result. So the greatest common divisor of two number, positive number A and B, is the same as the greatest common divisor of the number B and A modular B. We never mentioned that before, A modular B. And in many cases, people use this notation. Okay, percentile. Now, what is A modulo B? A modulo B is the remainder when A is divided by B. Remember the remainder, right? So when we divide A by B, then we cut A into a chunk of fragment, each of length B. So we chunk B, 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 and each of is B. And then the remainder is a small, small piece which is smaller than b if it's greater than b we can still cut right now a modulo b is the remainder when a is divided by b now what does that mean so the remainder should be a modulo b which is a remainder when a is divided by b so the remainder must be smaller than b right because A divides by B, okay? And then remainder should be smaller than B. If it's bigger than B, we can divide, a, a, cut another chunk of fragment B, right? So now, when I say the greatest, when you calculate the greatest common divisor of A and B, you can actually do this. You calculate the greatest common divisor of B, and A modulo B, modulo B. So that means, you know, if A and B are two numbers, and these B and A modulo B are also two numbers, but they are smaller than A and B. We're gonna use some examples later. And this is actually the algorithm. We can use this algorithm, okay? Um, it's a it's called a recursive algorithm okay because when you actually define this euclid of a and b then we can actually eventually can re return the euclid of b and the a mod b which is so so this is called a recursive algorithm that means in order to solve the problem we can actually eventually turn the problem into the same problem of smaller scale Okay, so let's actually look at the example. Okay, here we're going to actually look at the example of finding the greatest common divisor of 710 and 310. Okay, now the Euclidean algorithm is pretty simple. Okay, now the idea is in order to find the GCD of 710 and the 310, we just need to repeatedly use the algorithm we just discussed in the previous, right? So let's first look at the, uh, the diagram. Let's understand how we can actually do this. So suppose that uh, we, in general, we want to find the GCD of A and B. Okay, now, first thing we need to do is we want to actually switch the, the value of A and B. We first assume both A and B are positive because if it's negative, we can turn into a positive, right? And this doesn't actually change the result. So, so if A and B are both positive, and we also gonna actually switch the value of A and B 
if a is smaller than b we just want to make sure a is always greater than b and this also won't change the result because the greatest common divisor of a and b is the same as the greatest common divisor of b and a right it doesn't matter we switch a the, 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 the position for a and b but to make it consistent we always going to do the switch so let's say we start from here so we first check the value of a and b if a is greater than b okay if a is greater than b now we swap a and b okay okay i'm sorry if a is greater than b if yes we don't do anything so a is greater than b we don't do anything but a is greater than b if if the answer is no it's actually b is greater than or equal to a then we swap a and b after we swap then we move forward to the next step now then we divide a by b so now you know why we always want to swap a and b to make sure a is bigger than b right because we always going to divide a by b so we have to make sure b is smaller than a okay otherwise if we actually divide divide a smaller number by a bigger number then we always get the same result that the quotient is always zero because there's no way we can divide a smaller number by a big number but the remainder is always a in this case so it doesn't make any make a sense you don't actually game anything right so we always make a bigger than b so then we divide a by b okay when we divide a by b then we supposed to have a remainder okay so then if the remainder is greater than zero that means b cannot completely divide a divides a okay there's a remainder so if the remainder is greater than zero then what we're going to do is we replace a with b replace a with b so that case so we replace a with b okay replace b with r replace b replace a with b replace b with r okay so okay now in algorithm we just say we still do actually find that the greatest common divisor of a and b but in this case this in the second round a is already not the original a it's b now b is or not the original a, b it's actually the remainder of the remainder when a is divided by b so this basically give you the clue that uh, you know you actually you still are going back to these step but the value of a and b has been changed okay now we actually keep doing this keep this circle until r greater than zero greater than zero is no longer true that means r is zero so if r is zero that means the remainder is zero then we know that the gcd is the final value of v okay so now when you check this you will find out you will you find that the greatest common divisor for a and b then we say okay i i don't know what what is the common divisor but i know the the greatest common divisor of a and b is the same as the greatest common divisor of b and r now in this case you know a is bigger than b right b is always smaller than a but now b we replace a with b and replace r with we replace b with r so b is smaller than a and r is smaller than b so that means we turn the original problem of the greatest common divisor of a and b into 
the same problem of smaller numbers. So in this case, B is smaller than A, R is smaller than B, right? Now, if we still actually find out that R is greater than zero, and then we can continue. Okay, so we're going to replace B by R and then replace R by B modular R. So that means divide B by R and uh, with the remainder. So we actually can make it smaller and smaller. Okay, so eventually, once the number is too small, that until I is zero, then we finish. Let's check this. So we can actually turn the problem of finding the greatest common divisor of 710 and 310 into the problem of finding the greatest common divisor of 310 and 710 modular 310. Now, what is 710 modular 310? That's a remainder, right? When we divide 710 by 310, now, let's do this. It's 2. Right? So now, 710 divided by 310, we got a quotient 2 and remainder 90. So, so that's a remainder. So this is the same as um, GCD 310 and 90. So we turn the original problem into the same problem of smaller numbers. Of course, it should be easier to calculate the greatest common divisor of 310 and 90 than 710 and 310, right? Now, we can repeat this process, right? So now, the GCD of 310 and the 90 can be calculated by changing it to a smaller, the same problem with smaller scale. Right? And replace 310 with 90. And replace 90 with 310 modular 90. Okay. Now what's the 310 modular 90? And we're going to do another division. Okay. Let's actually do the other division. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to erase that one. Okay. I'm going to erase that one. Okay. So then... We can do the division again. 310 divided by 90. Um, we can say 327. Right? 3 times 90 is 270. 0. And uh, what's that? 4. Right? It's 11. 11 subtract 7 is 4 and because we borrow one from the pre the from the uh, 100 position so it's a 40 so now this is even smaller problem than the previous one then we continue. And GCD of 40, 90, modular 40. And what is 90 modular 40? Uh, so we're going to do the division again. Uh, let me actually put it, put it over here. 90, 40, we'll put a 2. So 80, 10, right? So then we have a GCD of 40 and a 10. Now we are closer. So then it becomes GCD of 10 and the 40 modulo 10. Now what is 40 modulo 10? Because 40 divided by 10, 
we got a quotient 3, 4, and remainder 0, right? Let's say 40 divided by 10. It's a 4, 40. So remainder is 0, right? So it's a GCD of 10 and a 0. So now, we know that GCD of 10 and 0 is 10. Okay. So, we find out the greatest common divisor of 710 and 310 is 10. Now, this over here, so we actually just, just write, you know, write the same Euclidean algorithm using the math formula. So basically, the first base, first actually equation means if we find, if we try to find the greatest common divisor between 710 and 310 is when we divide 710 by 310, we got a quotient of two and remain the 90. Okay? And then we turn the problem of finding the greatest common divisor of 710 and 310 to the, to the same problem of finding the greatest common divisor of 310 and 90, right? And then we divide 310 by 90, we got a quotient 3 and the remainder 40. And then we turn these uh, the GCD of 310 on the 90 into the GCD of 90 and 40. Replace, replace 310 by 90, replace the uh, 90 by 40. Okay, now we divide 90 by 40, we got a quotient 2 and remainder 10. And then we turn the problem of, you know, finding the GCD of 90 and 40 into the problem of finding the GCD of 40 and 10. So then we divide 40 by 10, and we got remainder 0, right? So, so that 10 is the greatest common divisor. That's the beauty of Euclidean algorithm. So we can try to find the GCD of two numbers, and then we convert the problem into a finding the GC of two smaller number by using the modular operation. Take a look at this example. This is very good. And we can actually uh, work on four more examples if we have time. Now here, it's a much bigger problem. Now we know why we need a Euclidean algorithm. We try to find the greatest common divisor of these two numbers. <laughs> That's a big number, right? <laughs> so if I just put the common here, common here, common here, so it looks like uh, that's 10 billion, or 1 billion something, you know. That's, that's a big number. I think that's the 316,258,900 uh, and the 250. That's a huge number. Now let's find that the greatest common divisor of these two numbers. Now, if we don't use the Euclidean algorithm, think about this. To find the greatest common divisor of these two numbers, the first thing we need to do is find all the list of divisor for the first number and the list of divisor for the second number and then we compare the list of the divisors of both of the number and find the, the common divisor and also the greatest common divisor, right? That's a lot of work. Now using the Euclidean algorithm, we can, you know, repeatedly use the formula that uh, we can actually reduce the, uh, the problem into the greatest common divisor problem of a smaller number. So, let's say A is this number, the bigger number, B is a smaller number, because B, um, this is a bigger than B, the first number is bigger than B, because it has more, one more digit. So the first thing we're going to do is, we're going to actually divide A, we're going to divide A by B. So we got a quotient of 3, and remainder Still a big number, right? But the remainder is smaller than B, right? So of course it's smaller than A because B is smaller than A. 
So I R1 is smaller than B. Okay. So now the greatest common divisor of A and B. To find the greatest common divisor of A and B, we turn this problem into the problem of finding the greatest common divisor of B and R1. Right? So it's now the GCD of A and B becomes GCD of B and R1. Now, let's repeat this. So we divide B by R1. So we got a quotient to 1, and we got a remainder, R2. And R2 is smaller than R1. Of course, it's smaller than R1. And R1 is smaller than B. So now we turn this GCD problem of B1 and R1 into the GCD problem. GCD, finding the GCD of R1, we replace B by R1, we replace R1 by I2. Right? Still bigger problem. And then divide R1 by R2. And we got a quotient to 2 and remainder. Now that's smaller. It's a 3 million and a 313. 1,772, that's a smaller number. So then, we're going to turn the problem of finding the GCD of R1 and R2 into the problem of finding the GCD of R2 and R3. So divide R2 by R3, we got a quotient of 31. Wow, that's a, that's a good one. And then the remainder, R4, which is smaller than this. Okay, now the same problem of GCD of R2 and R3 becomes the problem of GCD of R3 and R4. And then continue to divide R3 by R4, we got a quotient to 2 and a remainder. What's that? 137,984. It's even smaller. So it's still not zero, right? It's, always, it's still greater than 0. So then we're going to continue to do this. And we replace the R3 with R4. And replace the R4 with R5. So now this problem, the original problem, we after a couple of steps, the original problem turned into the problem of finding the GCD of R4 and R5, which is much, much smaller problem, right? And then when we divide R4 by I5, we got a Q6, that's 11, and uh, the remainder R6. So then the problem becomes, you know, the GCD of R5 and the R6. So divide R5 by I6, divide R5 by I6, R6. We got a quotient of 1 and the remainder 6. 67,914. And then convert the problem into a smaller problem. Replace R5 by I6, replace R6 by I7. And then divide I6 by I7, we got a quotient, and we got a remainder. Wow! R8, 2,156. Now the problem continues. We, we continue to do this, replace R6 with R1, R7, replace R7 with R8, and we divide R7 by R8, we got a quotient 31, and the remainder 1077. Okay, now replace, still greater than zero, right? So replace R7 by I8, now we, the problem becomes finding the GCD of R8 and R9. And divide R8 by I9, we got a quotient 2, we got remainder 0. Then we terminate. And we know this is the answer. So the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is 1078. Still a lot of work, but much, much easier than finding the, the divisors of both numbers and find the greatest one, right? That's still... And also, 
if we can write the computer program, this is going to be a very simple program. It's just a recursive program. Even the, the coding is going to be very simple. Okay, that's the end of module 9A.